choice. We've made that decision to magnify God, to glorify Him, to see His greatness. We've made that conscious de decision to look to Him. And you know, if you, if you sit there and you decide, well, I'm just going to sit here and wait for it to happen and to fall on me, it's never going to fall on you. It's never going to happen. You have to make a choice. You have to say, Lord, I'm just laying down all my pride. I'm laying down everything that I am. I'm surrendering to you and I'm going to magnify you. I'm going to praise you and worship you. And that's what happens when we as God's people choose to magnify him through worship and love him. And suddenly our hearts become consumed with that love of him and we begin to see him and he begins to be real in our lives but it doesn't just happen we make that choice you you can you can choose whether to worship god or whether to just sit there and wait for god to drop something on you <laughs> it doesn't just happen like that you have to make that decision to lay down your life, to be that living sacrifice. You have to say to God, Lord, I, I just, I'm not holding on to any of this stuff anymore. I'm not going to try and run my own life anymore. You know, we weren't designed to run our own life. You can't do it. You can try. And people try all the time. And some people seem very successful, but when they get to the end of their life, suddenly they're facing eternity. And what does all their life and all of, all of what they've done matter anymore? See, eternal things are what matters. And, um, and I just feel like tonight that God wants us to know that he's there all of the time He's ever present. He's the great I am. He's not the great I was or the great I will be. He's present right now in our situations and whatever we're in, he's there and he wants to be involved. It's not him that's withholding from you. It's you that's not receiving and it's always that way around because God is always giving. God is always speaking. God is always ready to pour out every blessing into your life. It's us that shut the door. You know, the Word of God is an incorruptible seed, the Bible says. And the, and the parable of the sower shows four heart conditions. And the seed is the same. All The seed that falls onto the stony ground is the same seed that falls into the into the good soil. The seed that falls amongst the, the thorns is the same seed that falls into the shallow ground. The seed isn't the problem. It's where it goes into that's the problem. It's the heart condition that's the problem. It's not, it's not the word of God. It's not that. The variable thing is our heart. And so if God's word just doesn't seem to work in your life, if it's just not impacting your life, you need to look at the condition of the soil of your heart because that's the problem, not the word of God, not the power of God. And you know, the good thing is, that we can change, we can change when we surrender. You don't change your heart by trying hard. You don't change your heart by trying to live better, by trying to read your Bible more. These are all good things, but that isn't what changes your heart. What changes your heart is when you surrender to Jesus. <laughs> when you, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. And he, he makes that soil in your heart begin to work 
And then it's, it, it receives the word of God. And that word just takes root in our hearts and begins to grow. And that's when fruit is seen. You know, you don't have to know what somebody is thinking. You, you, you can tell what somebody is dwelling on in their <coughs> mind. You can tell by what's growing in their garden. You can tell what they've been sowing. You can tell what they've been meditating on. You can tell because it's growing in their life. And you know, God wants good things for us. And he wants us to, he, he wants us to dwell on good things, not on the bad stuff. Because whatever we fill our minds with comes out of our heart, out of our mouths. It comes out in actions in our lives. And that ain't what I'm talking about, but do you, do you want to say that? I thought he'd had a word from God then and we'll come to sit <laughs> Ready to sit down, Johnny, if you have. I'll just remind you a little bit about what I started speaking on last week. And it was James chapter 2, verse 20 to 26. And we talked about faith without works being dead, but that, that word dead doesn't mean non-existent. That means unproductive, not working in our lives. And faith without works is fruitless. And, and you can't see any fruit of your faith. Um, and then we talked a little bit about Abraham and how Abraham believed God and, and God gave him a son, him and Sarah a son in their old age. Mm. And for 25 years they believed the promise and then they continued to walk in that faith. To, they continued to walk in that faith and when God tested their faith, and God said to Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, and I want you to sacrifice him on the altar. I want you to do all... And Abraham never flinched. Straight away, he got up early in the morning and he went um, to the mountains of Moriah, which is the same mountains where Jesus was, um, was crucified. And... Um, um, I just uh, it, it, it showed that he was in faith all of the time because he said to the servants who went with him when they were getting near to where the mountain was he turned to the servants and he said you stay here with the donkey while the lad and me goes up there and we, we're going to worship God and then we will return he believed God all the way and never never wavered in his faith never became double minded in his faith even though he may not have understood everything that God told him to do but he trusted God with all his heart and Abraham was a man of faith <coughs> he's, he's called the father of faith mm -hmm. because he, he trusted God so much and um, so with Abraham believed God and that's when God declared that Abraham was righteous, in right standing with him. When God first told him that he was going to have a son, Abraham believed God and that's when God said he was in right standing with him. And it's the same with us. So it wasn't Abraham's works that made him right with God. It was Abraham's faith in God and he trusted God and he believed his word and you know it's it's a big revelation sometimes to us as Christians that believers believe I <laughs> just think about that I, I heard that and I thought oh no believers believe that's what we do we are believers, so we believe and so you know we need to be we need to be ready just to trust in God and trust in his word and um, 
Abraham believed God and the works that he did in believing God and stepping out and doing what God had said and not flinching at what God had said and even believing when everything seemed to be going in the opposite way, when everything seemed to be coming towards loss and losing the promise, he still continued to believe God and trusted every word that God spoke. And by those works, Abraham's faith became visible, it became active, it became productive, and those works declared Abraham faithful, and, and you could see his faith in action. So this is the truth. We are not saved by good works. If you try to earn anything off God by good works, those works in the Bible are called dead works. Because you can't earn anything off God. You can't earn favour off him. You can't earn his mercy. You can't earn his kindness. You can't earn his love. You can't earn his, his compassion. All of those are yours. It's a gift. We receive everything. He provides everything we need by his grace. His grace, his goodness has provided for everything that you will need in this life. And we receive that by faith. And we don't earn any of that. It's all by faith. So you try to do anything with works to try and earn anything of God. The Bible says these are dead works. And when we get to heaven, the, the works that we do are judged. And that is the wood, hay and stubble. That is the stuff that goes up in smoke. Even if, you, even if you've dedicated your whole life to it, if it's because you're doing it because you want to earn God's favour and you want to stay in God's books, what you don't realise is you're already in his favour. You're already in his good books. You're blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus and he loves you. And when he looks at you, he sees his son. He, he, he sees who you are in your born again spirit. He sees you, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And it's not based on works at all. But you know, Paul and James were not preaching two different things. The truth is we're not saved by good works. We are saved for good works. Let that just sink in. We're not saved by good works. We are saved for good works. So good works are still important to God. And Paul emphasised that we are not saved by good works. That was the message of Paul. He said we are not saved by good works. When he talked to the Galatians, you'll see, he gets quite, quite fierce with them. Oh, you foolish Galatians, what do you think you're doing trying to earn? You try not by what you're doing and it's by grace. And so his message was um, that we are not saved by good works. But James emphasised the other side of the coin, if you like. He emphasised that we are saved for good works. So it's the same, it's the same coin, but two different sides. And James, um, Paul's audience was in danger of relying on their own good works. And, and they were trying to earn something on God. <coughs> They'd started out all right, they believed God and they received, you know, Jesus as their saviour and it was not, you know, anything to do with them. But then they went suddenly turned from grace and started into the law again and trying to do things according to the law. But, you know, we can't rely on our own works. And that's what Paul was telling his audience because his audience was in danger of trying to trust in their own works of righteousness. While James's readers, they were excusing themselves from good works as if to say, well, it doesn't matter because, you know, it's all by grace. And so 
they, they were showing to others only a faith that was dead and unproductive. They were still saved. Their faith in Jesus as their saviour made them righteous in God's eyes, but no one else could see it. There was no fruit of righteousness in their lives, and so their lack of works made them look unrighteous. It, they, the world, could, nobody could see, nobody could see on the inside. You see, people can only see our fruit. They can't see the root. If you look at a, a tree outside, you can see what's above the ground. You can see what's visible, but you can't see the roots of that tree. And you know, the roots that we have in Christ are not visible to the world. They need to see the fruit. And that has to be, that has to be worked out of our lives. God's put it all in there. When you receive the Holy Spirit into your life, you didn't just get bits of him. You got the whole package. You got all of the fruit. And you got all of the gifts. And all of that is on the inside of you. And so when you say to God, Oh God, give me patience. You're asking for something that he's already given you. Because he's given you the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And all of these things are on the inside of us. And when the Bible tells us that we have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, he's talking about working it out. What's inside needs to be working out. You know, God was always trying to get in now he's trying to get out. <laughs> and we, we sometimes, we, we hold back. And we just get independent of God. And, and we don't let that light that is in us shine out. So that everyone can see. So your fellow man, they can't see who you are on the inside. They can't see that you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. They can only see your faith by your conduct and by your, by your works, the good works that you do, they declare your righteousness. Those works declare your righteousness. People can see that you love God. People can see that you are right with God when they can see the things that you do. So that's why it's really important that we do these good works. By this, Jesus said, in John 15, verse 8, My Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Jesus said his Father is glorified by the fruit that we bear. But we don't have to work hard. This is where the church goes so wrong sometimes. We think we've got to work hard at producing that fruit. But God is using, Jesus was using this fruit tree, like a, he used the vine. And there was no, there was no um, trying and straining for a fruit tree to produce fruit. You never hear a fruit tree straining and, and working hard to produce fruit. It just draws from the roots and the fruit is effortless, it comes out, it's a natural thing that happens and it's the same in a Christian life. We are, he is the vine and we are the branches and we have to draw on his goodness. We have to draw on who he is in us. It's Christ in us that is the hope of glory. We have to draw on him and that fruit will be produced. In John 13 verses 34 and 35, Jesus said this, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have loved for one another. The world won't know that you are a disciple of Jesus just because you go to church. The world won't know that you are a disciple of Jesus 
just because you've got a Bible on your shelf. The world will never know that you are a disciple of Jesus because you wear a cross round your neck. The only way that the world will know that you are a disciple of Jesus is if you love others the way that he loved you. And that is unconditional. And you know, we have to open up our heart to that kind of love because we can't produce that kind of love in and of ourselves. It has to come from the Spirit of God who lives within us. Remember the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, but love is one is, is that fruit of the Spirit. And we have that in us and we have to draw on that and we have to use that love. We love him because he first loved us. Just gonna talk for a couple of minutes about a lady called Rahab now. Now Rahab, James uh, speaks about Rahab in James 2 verses 25. <clears throat> It says, likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? So Rahab was a lady who lived in Jericho <clears throat> and she wasn't a lady of uh, a good reputation. She was a prostitute. And yet God used this lady when he, when he sent two spies into Jericho uh, to spy out the land and they ended up at this lady's house and they stayed there and she protected them because the king then found out that there were these two men in the city spying out and they wanted, he wanted to know where they were. She hid them on the roof of her house. It was a flat roof. <laughs> and she covered them up with, with flax and she, and she hid them there. And then when the soldiers had gone, she let them out of the window and they escaped by another route. And, um, and so, but they had this conversation. While the men were there, this is what Rahab said. I know that the Lord has given you the land. Now, <coughs> she said, past tense, I know that the Lord has given you the land. They spoke to her earlier in um, Joshua chapter 1. They said, the Lord is giving us the land. So they were, they were speaking the same way as Rahab. Rahab was speaking, it's a done deal. You've got it. You've got this land and she believed it. She said that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, <coughs> Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. That means they were terrified. Mm -hmm. When your heart melts for fear, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's, a, it's a bad situation. Neither did, they, neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now, Rahab believed because she heard the reports. She'd heard the stories of how God had set Israel free. And she'd come to faith. Even though she was a pagan woman living in a pagan city, in worshipping in pagan temples, even though all of that, she heard about the God of Israel and she believed because she said, for the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. And how she'd come to that faith was because she heard the word of God through these stories. And we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And she believed. 
That's when she was made right with God, when she believed. Now she had a lot of mess in her life and she had a lot of things to get sorted out. She'd not had the privilege of hearing the word. She'd not, she'd not known true worship. She'd not known any of that, but yet she believed. And then she said this, she poured out her love and concern for others and this was the outworking of her faith because she poured out love for others. She said, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father and my mothers, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. Now there was a great risk that she was taking by helping the Israelite spies. She was betraying her pagan culture. She was turning her back on all she had ever known and she was trusting God whom she'd only heard these stories about and yet her faith had come by hearing and now she believed that their God was the only true God and her faith began to work and she began to work out her faith and the spies promised on two conditions that she tied and hung a scarlet robe out of her window so that when Israel attacked that that would identify her house and that was that only those inside her house would be saved only those who came into Rahab's house would be saved. They would be free from any vows if then any of her family was outside of Rahab's house and they got killed. Rahab couldn't come back on that. Her family had to be in her house. And you know, apparently, her wider family came to faith as well because they believed. They were in that house when Israel attacked. They came to faith because of, of Rahab and they went into that house. Even though their city was one of the most fortified cities that was around, they didn't trust in their city walls. They didn't trust in this man-made fortress. They were trusting in God. And James couldn't have chosen two more different people as examples. He chose Abraham and Abraham was a major Bible figure, the father of the faithful and a respected man, while Rahab was a minor figure, a foreigner, she wasn't even a Jew, a prostitute and a disreputable woman, two completely different people. And do you remember we talked about God not showing partiality? He doesn't favor one person above another. He loved Abraham, but he loved Rahab just as much. And in fact, Rahab ended up being in the family line of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that's how significant and valued this pagan woman was to Jesus. She, he loved her. And, and, and you know, God used Rahab in a powerful way. And so, just to come to a conclusion on these few verses. James 2 verse 26 says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So, God declares us righteous when we believe, but our works declare us righteous when man sees that work. It shows our righteousness in, in it that is on the outside then. People see who we really are in Christ when we show these works. <coughs> it's not working to get anything of God, off God, we've got everything we need. But you know, as unproductive and as useless as a human body is without a human spirit on the inside of it. It's, it's got no practical value. Once the spirit has left the body, the body can't move. The body can't do anything. The body is now unproductive and useless. 
And this is what James was trying to say. Just as much as that happens, so faith without works is dead. And the dangers of the dying faith are very real, but they don't include hell. Sin is still deadly, and we must stay away from sin. Mm -hmm. Because I know that it doesn't include hell, because James never once says to his readers that they're not saved. You read through James, and you've been reading through James. Never once does he say to the readers, you're not saved. Nor does he set out a plan of salvation. Or warn them of a false assurance. Because his readers were saved. Because he addressed them as my beloved brethren. He was talking to those who were saved. To his brothers and sisters in Christ. James wasn't saying that a person with dead faith has no faith and so is unsaved. Again, this means that a person with dead faith, no works of righteousness, still has saving faith because saving faith is through gr the grace of God. It's by grace through faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God not of works, lest anyone should boast. The person with dead faith is simply not living by faith. They are not being fruitful or glorifying God in their lives. Their works cannot declare them righteous and there is no outward evidence of the life inside of them. And so that isn't what we want to do. One day we will stand before God and there will be a judgment, but it's not a judgment that sends you to a lost eternity. If you know Jesus Christ as your saviour, your name is in the Lamb's book of life and it's by grace. But there is a judgment on your works. And you know it says that there are rewards and that's where the, our works are put through the fire. If they burn up, they've been wood, hay and stubble. Nothing of eternal value. And your life has, on earth has been nothing of eternal value. It's just wood, hay, stubble. But some works go through that fire and they're gold and silver and precious stones and they don't burn up. And he, and he talks about um, receiving a crown. And you know, it's not for me, it's not about getting something off God, a reward, because I've done good works and I've, and I've tried to you know, show Jesus through my life. But when I get there, I just imagine sometimes, I let my mind imagine just standing before Jesus. And the one thing I want to do is to take off a beautiful crown, a crown that is full of gold and silver, precious stones and I want to cast it before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because all the glory belongs to him and all the honour belongs to him and in my life I want to glorify him with everything that I am and I, I don't do that perfectly and I know that that is in the heart of every believer we want to glorify God we want people to see Jesus in us. But that takes surrender. That takes surrendering your life. And that takes that you, we, we then renew our mind in his word. And when his word gets on the inside of us, because a surrendered life is a fertile soil. That's what makes you <coughs> fertile in your heart when you surrender to God. Not when you try hard, but when you surrender your life to Him and allow the Word of God in you and then that begins to work in you. And that's the power of God at work in our lives. His Word. And I just pray that that will have encouraged you. So, thanks, John.